Welcome to the Asteroid Track. This is the first session of the Asteroid Track. And as you could read in the uh, uh, program, uh, we're, we're concerned about, uh, well, somewhere an asteroid has our planet in its sights. Um, and these are potentially incredibly dangerous things. Just ask your neighboring dinosaurs. The, um, on the other hand, in addition to being risks that we need to avoid, uh, the resources of asteroids are vast. They, uh, they make the resources of the surface of the Earth and, and even the surface of Mars added in uh, pale in comparison. So the real question for us is uh, how, do we, uh, how do we utilize the uh, uh, resources of uh, asteroids without uh, incurring too much risk? And how great are those risks? And uh, is the reward worth it? The, uh, it's clear that asteroids are threats. Large ones cause extinction level events. Uh, global devastation. Tiny ones can cause significant injuries. Um, ask the people in Chelyabinsk. Um, and yet, uh, the early markets for asteroids uh, or asteroid materials are here on Earth or here near Earth. And that means that we're likely to want to bring those resources from far, far away where they're safe and not as threatening to uh, very close, which means that they are in your backyard. Whoops. Um, so basically, uh, any movement of asteroids sounds dangerous, and uh, the panel here will discuss the question, do the riches outweigh the risks? I'm the moderator, Stephen uh, Kevy, and we will let each of these uh, gentlemen give a five or so minute uh, discussion of their viewpoint on what's more important, threats or risk, or weigh the relative balance. Everyone agrees they're both, I'm sure. And then we'll have, I'll put up to, open it up to some questions from the audience, and if anybody doesn't ask the questions I have in mind, I'll ask them myself. So, so why don't we start with, um, start with my phone. Um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Martin Elvis. Okay. Uh, Let's see, just one second. I was going to mention a little bit about who he was. For those of you who, uh, and it's in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, born in the United Kingdom, Martin Elvis got his PhD at the University of, uh, how do you pronounce that? Lester. Lester. Uh, in uh, 1978, he moved to the USA full time in 1980 to work on the first true X ray telescope, the Einstein Observatory, at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge. With the demise of the Einstein Observatory in, in 1981, he pursued active galactic nuclei at other wavelengths using a wide variety of telescopes, leading to uh, the 1994 Atlas of Quasar Energy Distributions, which has served as a standard since and has been cited almost a thousand times. He later developed, developed a model for the structure of quasars, the quasar atmosphere, cited a thousand times, which remains a major focus of his research. The change of direction for the human space program at NASA from the moon to astronauts as the, uh, for, to asteroids as the first step towards Mars seemed to him to offer a strategic potential for cheaper, larger space observatories. He's begun to work on near-Earth asteroids, their detection and their properties, with a view to helping NASA's explore, exploitation, exploration forward. Eventually, he's convinced the commercial potential of the asteroids will transform our space endeavors to a truly large scale and will, in the process, make access to space cheap and routine. Uh, Dr. Elvis has published over 300 papers in refereed journals and with over 15,000 citations, is one of the 250 most highly cited researchers in astronomy and space physics. So, um, Dr. Elvis. Okay, got my slide. Oh. All right, I have to pull up your slides. Mm -hmm. um, whoops. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm. Uh, whoops. 
got to say, uh, that Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics tag is just to give me some street creds with you guys. Uh, but I'm absolutely here on my own uh, time and my own dime. Uh, because I often tend to say things at this kind of meeting that are seriously not Smithsonian policy. So I'm not speaking for the Smithsonian what at, at all. Uh, I thought I'd be ending up one of the later speakers, so I uh, thought I'd better think of something that would not be covered by other people. So uh, the choice we have, is it um, a threat or a resource? Are asteroids threats or resources? The answer is it's, it's a false dichotomy. Uh, they are both. Uh, and I think we need the resource, having the resources will help us uh, deal with the space threat. But I thought I'd tell you a little about other resources that you, that exist in, that may exist in asteroids that we haven't heard much about. Everyone talks about mining the water for fuel and life support and about the uh, precious metals like the platinum group metals uh, because they're so valuable per, per, per gram. But uh, I, there are other possibilities, and those, uh, as an academic, long-term academic, I think there's a lot of research to be done uh, if we can get hold of bulk, prop, bulk samples of asteroids. So I had a uh, talk, so when I started talking about this, a student asked me, uh, well, do you think there could be strange uh, new materials on asteroids uh, like unobtainium from the movie Avatar? And of course, I was like, well, professorial, oh, come sunny boy, you know, you know nothing, right? Uh, of course not. Uh, but I think I was wrong and that the student was right to be open-minded uh, because there are possibilities. Uh, you may have heard of quasi-crystals. This is a kind of crystal which doesn't have a simple repeating pattern, but has a much more complex structure, just like the uh, Arabic tiling that you find in, in some of those fine palaces. This is from the Alhambra. These were theoretical ideas. No one knew if they could really exist. Um, but they were found. Sorry. It's, it's coming on and off for some reason. Anyway, let me go back. There we go. Uh, but uh, they were found in the lab by Dan Schechtman, who got the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 2011. And uh, so that's a fairly big deal. Uh, but uh, someone else who was uh, involved in coming up with the idea wondered if not only you could find these things in the lab, but do quasi-crystals occur naturally in, in, the, in the Earth's rocks? And so he instituted a search, and after thousands and thousands of uh, uh, samples were x-rayed, to look at their crystallographic patterns, you see bottom left there. Uh, they came up with just one example of a quasi-crystal occurring in the wild. And after much uh, very interesting adventures, going to the easternmost parts of Russia, very inhospitable places, they came across a bunch more samples of this rock, and it turned out they're meteorites. So of all the rocks on Earth, you find none that create quasi-crystals unless they come to us from space. So there could be materials like this that form in space and not on Earth. Also, there are uh, complex molecules that form only in space. Uh, this is a piece of the uh, Murchison meteorite, which landed in, in Australia in 1969. And it's very black and it feels like rock, chunk of rock. But um, Glenn McPherson, who curates the collection at the Smithsonian of this meteorite, he says if you take a sl fresh slice of it and smell it, it smells like tar, right, like asphalt. And so that tells you how rich in organic materials uh, these asteroids can be. These are the carbonaceous asteroids, right? And among those uh, materials could also be many things that we do not make on Earth. Uh, for instance, this is a rare amino acid, isovaline, which this report suggests is useful in suppressing epileptic fits. There could be medically useful materials that we find in space. Maybe we can later synthesize them on Earth, but they may be naturally occurring in, in asteroids, and uh, we will find them by going through and getting large samples of asteroidal material, we may be able to find it. It may be that materials uh, exist in space, but not, but not on Earth, because uh, there's a million years when the uh, pre-solar nebula was condensing to form these asteroids where very slowly accreted molecules could uh, occur and in zero gravity and in, in cold conditions, conditions we cannot replicate on, on Earth or even in the space station because they take too long. You can't get a million year grant and very few grad students will stick around that long. 
right? So uh, it could be that, that, that we've got a natural, uh, uh, the solar system performed natural experiments we cannot replicate on Earth, and this is very likely to lead to unobtainium, otherwise uh, strange materials that we could not find on Earth. If you want to get really out there, there's more possibilities. The Big Bang uh, could have left nuggets of quark material, of, of, of um, quark nuggets, uh, yeah, quark material, this is like nu nu nuclear density rock uh, material, um, many thousands of times denser than anything we see uh, around us. A few asteroids could actually be remnant, remnants of the Big Bang, and this may be explained the dark matter that astronomers, like myself, look for. And if we found one of these rocks, I have no, no idea what we'd do with it, but it would be obviously fascinating for science and would surely lead to interesting developments. So I think there's a lot of exotic stuff out there. Uh, I would love to see us uh, take scientific measurements of large numbers of uh, asteroids in bulk. I was very keen on the asteroid retrieval mission, which is, I was on the first Keck study proposing this, bringing an asteroid back from its solar orbit to somewhere around cis-lunar space, so that is between the Earth and the Moon somewhere, so we can study it in bulk. 500 tons of material allows you to do much more than 50 uh, grams, which is what, 60 grams, which is what the first re uh, sample return mission will bring back. It's very qualitatively different. So I think there's a lot of resources we don't even know about yet, and so I'm coming down more on the res resources and the risks side. Thank you. Um, next, uh, the next speaker, we're in clever alphabetical order, will be um, Stephen Cordenkamp, uh, senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. He, um, uh, Steve Cordenkamp uh, is in Tucson, Arizona, so he's not too far away. He's also, in addition to his uh, role at the, as a senior scientist uh, at, in, at the Planetary Science Institute, he's the adjunct professor in the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona, and, uh, and is an accomplished children's author, having published 21 children's science books. Uh, Corden Camp's research background is in computer simulations of planet formation and orbital dynamics of asteroids, comets, and interplanetary dust. So, uh, Stephen? Let's see. Right, so I guess my opinion on threats or resources is neither um, and both. Uh, statistically speaking and historically speaking, I would say neither. Uh, maybe February 15th changed that a little bit. Um, but I do want to point out here, uh, I have a still image of what I'd hoped to be an animation. You can see the orbits of the inner planets along with uh, a little asteroid for every one of the nearly 10,000 Earth-crossing asteroids that we know about. Um, and so on this scale, you know, it looks like we're swimming in a sea of asteroids, and that, that sort of lends some credence to the idea that there is a threat here. Um, these are only the big ones that we know about. So if we, let's see, go to, just space bar changes it here. If we look at sort of a census, okay, we know about 10,000, what does that imply if we extrapolate to the, to the total population that we can't see? NASA has done this recently with their WISE uh, space telescope, and they, they suggest that we know about 90% of all of the asteroids that are, are a kilometer in size or bigger, um, a mile across or so. Um, what does that leave us? Well, we know of about 860 that are of this size. And if that's 90%, then there's another 50 to 100 out there that are kilometer size that are crossing Earth's orbit. We just have no idea where they are. Okay, so that's, that's a potential threat. If you go down to smaller sizes, though, for instance, look at the one on the bottom, less than 100 meters in diameter, right? We, there's lots of question marks there. We have a few dozens of these that have come close enough to Earth so we could see them, but potentially tens of millions of these things that are 100 meters in size or bigger that we have no idea where they are. 100 meters or smaller. So the one that, that came in over Russia was about 17 meters in size, came out of the sun, we had no clue it was coming until it, it you know, lit up in the atmosphere. So something smaller than 100 meters, what can that do? 
Well, here is, uh, I'm from Arizona. Here is our famous uh, Behringer Crater in Arizona. It's about a kilometer across, half a mile across the crater. It was caused by an asteroid about 30 meters in diameter. So it's a very small asteroid that we know of maybe 1% of where all of them are can do something like this. Now, it's not an extinction event, but it's a very bad day if you're living in Arizona when this happens. Okay, this was 50,000 years ago. Humans had been on Earth for about 100,000 years when this happened. So we, we weren't populating this part of the, of the Earth, but uh, this, this happened in the, the existence of humans. So it would be a very, very bad day if one of these little tiny 30-meter asteroids, that particular one was made out of iron. It was a solid iron asteroid, hits the ground. Um, as it gives you sort of the human scale of that thing, a half mile in the background. Uh, behind my grandma there is the other edge of the crater. So it's just, just a bad day. Now in terms of resources and, and going to these asteroids, if we look at the same image that we had on the first part, and every asteroid that's easier to reach, energetically speaking, than the surface of the moon will paint green in this diagram here. We can reach about 10% of those known near-Earth asteroids, the 10,000 of them, about 10% of them are easier to get to than it is to get to the surface of the moon. So it's not even, you know, technologically it's not a challenge, but even energetically, meaning funding, it's not a challenge to get to these asteroids and land on their surface. They have such low gravity that you can just, you get to the asteroid, you can just touch down. If you want to get off again, you just do a push-up and you're back off into space. So, so energetically speaking, we can go to many of these uh, much more efficiently than, you know, to the surface of the moon. So I think in that sense, it, it's a fairly readily available resource um, to get to energetically. And it's also, it can be a threat if you think about even the smallest ones. Just a few meters in diameter can be uh, wreak havoc. So, thank you. Let's see, next in alphabetical order is uh, Mark Saunter. Uh, ooh, where's my slide? Um, let's see. Uh, Mark is uh, director of uh, mining and processing for Deep Space Industries. He previously founded Asteroid Enterprises in 1986 after giving an asteroid resource recovery talk at uh, an Aussie Space Engineering Conference in Sydney. Uh, in, and he founded his day job company, Radiation Advice and Solutions, um, in 95. Uh, Mark is a miner and well-known consultant to mining companies across the globe, uh, as well as an, ast an asteroid expert whose paper, The Technical and Economic Feasibility of Mining the Near-Earth Asteroids, is often cited in peer-reviewed papers. So. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I uh, only produced these slides this morning about 4 a.m., so uh, uh, I'm basically here focusing on the risk-benefit discussion. I'm leaving unsaid all of the comments that uh, Martin Elvis and Steve Cordenkamp made about the reality of the presence of potentially useful resources on the asteroids. I'm, I'm taking that as a given that we all understand that asteroids have got uh, potentially very useful materials in them. Um, risk, how do I drive this thing? What risks are there that might uh, come about in, in future asteroid mining ventures? There could be risks to others from Earth impact of returning payloads, payloads uh, of material being brought back to low Earth orbit or to high Earth orbit if they were not correctly um, guided or directed into the appropriate orbits. There could be risks of Earth impact of, uh, of uncontrolled payload return and those Earth impacts could result in damage or injury. There could be risks of impact with uh, in-orbit assets satellites owned by others have to be a very small risk because space is big and satellites are small. There could be risks to the operating company uh, arising from the loss of the payload or of the spacecraft. 
In future planning of asteroid mining ventures, the operators, the planners, the proponents, would have to take all these risks into, uh, into consideration and plan for their mitigation. In engineering, risk is defined generally in the papers as probability of something bad happening multiplied by the consequence or the value of the, of the damage resulting from that bad event. Risk equals probability times consequence. And that can be estimated using failure mode and effect analysis, event tree analysis, tools that are very uh, well known to aerospace engineers and nuclear engineers. And we can get an assessment of probability of, of uh, a, a, a misdirected uh, return by looking at statistics of events. As to how often do, do spacecraft get misdirected or does something go wrong with the guidance? It is clear that those of us that want to set up an asteroid mining venture will have to, will be required to quantify these risks and manage them, to do whatever is needed to, to mitigate them, and we'll have to justify our chosen mitigation methods. Much as we might like to be uh, pirates out in the, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the black depths of space with no legal controls, there will clearly be legal controls that we'll have to comply with. And there is a societal perception uh, requirement as well. Not only do we have to fulfil engineering requirements, we will have to fulfil societal perception requirements. And there's a, there's a well-known author and advisor to large corporations, a fellow by the name of Peter Sandman, who talks about what happens when, when, when the public becomes outraged by some proposed uh, or some uh, uh, actual accidental event that's been that's been foisted on them by, by, by uh, 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 an unfeeling corporation. Peter Sandman says that risk is hazard times outrage, and he means that in a sort of a sociological sense rather than a mathematical engineering sense. But his point is that engineering corporations, corporations wishing to do things, corporations wishing to propose uh, activities have to manage social acceptability of the risks that those proposals entail, as well as manage the engineering risks. And there are examples one could, one could bring up from the mining industry of, of, of things that have gone wrong, and, and basically a project gets shut down not by uh, an engineering shortfall, but by a social and political shortfall situation. In terrestrial mining projects, almost the first thing that gets discussed and considered is, in fact, risk. At the very earliest stages of a project concept study, risk is an important uh, uh, consideration. About a month ago, I was a member of a, of a, of a kick-off meeting for a pre-feasibility study for a large proposed underground copper mine in Australia, a new proposal. The very first item on the agenda of this very first meeting of all the external consultants and the principal and the primary engineering consultant, the very first meeting for the pre-feasibility study, the very first topic was risk. And the very first requirement was, uh, let's look at this draft risk register that our consultant has made up, and we'll use this and try and expand on it, see what we throw into it. The risk register was almost the first thing. It was the first thing on, on the do list. So in, in the mining industry in Australia and worldwide, the, the, the process that, that the, that the organisation, that the proponent, that the mining company goes through is first of all to try and define the project, what is the project concept, and that's not obvious. I'll be talking tomorrow about the, the non-obvious nature of defining your mining project. And then that proceeds forward to a pre-feasibility study that sieves the different mining options and the different processing options and, and seeks to get a cost for the entire project to maybe something like plus or minus 30%. And then that begins, if that, if that passes muster, if that PFS gets accepted by the company board as indicating that the, 
that the project may well be viable, then the, pro then the, then the, the company board will, 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 will um, press the go button on two further studies, the environmental impact study, which is about what? Guess what? Risk. Environmental impact is all about risk identification, risk to the external environment, risk to humanity, uh, be it workers or members of the public, and how to mitigate those risks. And the other study is the Bankable Feasibility Study, which seeks to get the cost estimate down to plus or minus 10%. Those, those are, the, are, the, are the sequence of events that, that occur in terrestrial mining, and guess what? They'll have to be the same sequence of events which will occur in space mining. And I just need to point out that the EIS, the Environmental Impact Study, and the BFS, the Bankable Feasibility Study, need to be regarded almost as conjoined twins. Both have to proceed through together because if the EIS finds some previously unidentified hazard that has to be controlled, that feeds back to the cost implications in the Bankable Feasibility Study. So the two are joined at the hip. A project cannot proceed forward unless both the EIS and the BFS are basically give it a tick. The same logic is going to apply in asteroid mining. So risk in project planning, a risk register, as I said, is the first item on the agenda at a pre-feasibility study kickoff meeting. All risks have to be identified, they have to be quantified, then the control options have to be listed and then chosen, and then after implementation, uh, after the consideration of what would happen, what would be the result of implementation, this reduces the various risks in the risk register, either down to levels that, that are acceptable or not. And if not, then of course you've got to go through the iteration again until the risks are reduced to a low enough level or the project fails. Uh, so, I'm just giving you this very, very top level vision of, of what a mining industry uh, um, uh, consultant, a uh, mining industry corporate uh, planning person would say, and it is all about risk hazard, risk or hazard identification, then quantification, then mitigation, and then its acceptability. And I know that I'm not talking much about space here, but I'm saying the same, the very same mindset's going to have to apply. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Bong Hui. Let's see. Well, fine, fine, mine. Um, and um, let's see. Let's see. Um, okay. Well, sorry about that. We're first track always is the first session is always the one that's the most confusing. Uh, Bong Wee is the Vance D. Kaufman Endowed Chair Professor of Aerospace Engineering and the Founding Director of the Asteroid Deflection Research Center at Iowa State University. Uh, he received his BS in uh, Aeronautical Engineering from Seoul National University and uh, an MS and a PhD degrees in Aeronautics and Astronautics from Stanford University. Um, in 2006, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics presented Professor Wee with the Mechanics and Control of Flight Award for his innovative research on advanced control of complex spacecraft, such as the Agile Imaging Satellites, Solar Sails, and Large Space Structures. He's the author of uh, an AIAA textbook, Space Vehicle Dynamics and Control. Um, he's co-authored 150 technical papers and 60 peer-reviewed journal articles in the area of space vehicle guidance, control, and dynamics. His current research, funded by a NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Phase II program, focuses on developing space technologies for mitigating the impact threat of, of hazardous asteroids and comets. Please welcome Dr. Wee. Thank you. Because I will be presenting my technical talk this afternoon, so I haven't prepared my PowerPoint. But I'd like to make a, my point very clear to all of you that we are really ready now to deploy or implement planetary defense system. So let's go back to our time frame last February. I'm pretty sure most of you remember what happened. We had a two <coughs> historical events on February 15 of 2013, this year. 
So before those two events, just talking about asteroid deflections, dinosaur extinctions happened 65 million years ago, was had the highest giggle factors. Everybody laughed, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the so-called uh, Chelyabinsk event happening on February 15. If that small, we call small, it's always relative, small, 17-meter diameter, we talk about diameter, had the material probability in terms of nickel ion, then we should have, have that air burst one second later. Then we might have had about human the sort of casual damage about more than 100,000. That is the energy contained in that small 17-meter asteroid. But we were very lucky, and we cannot just rely on that, oh, we missed another 50-meter another asteroid called DA-14 about 10 or 12 hours later. We cannot keep saying that we were just lucky and lucky, no more. So we are ready to deploy realistic uh, planetary defense system after many years uh, research and study. So I will be talking about more detailed technical uh, justifications and the readiness of such a space mission to be deployed in the near future. In terms of budget, everybody is, is just talking about budget. So overall budget will be much less than simply one billion dollars. So we are planning to develop two identical satellites. One will be on the ground as a spare to be used when something really happens. And the other one will be used for actual flight validation. Whenever we develop aerospace flight vehicle, we have to go through extensive ground testing, flight validation, checkup, another check, study and study. So we are ready and I will be talking about those exciting space projects currently funded by NASA Innovative Advanced uh, Concept Program Office. And I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's time for some questions. Do we have any initial audience questions? And do we have a micro microphone that uh, set up right there in the middle? Please line up and uh, ask away. Good morning. My name's Joe Rauscher. I'm a volunteer at NAS NSS headquarters, um, and I've recently volunteered to facilitate finding funding opportunities for projects that we've heard about this morning. And um, my question is, would it be possible to use the uh, justification for removing orbital debris from near-Earth orbit in some way to use as a tool to get funding for some of these projects you're talking about so that not only do you have the asteroid threat um, justification, but you could also add uh, using removal of orbital debris as a planetary defense a justification as well to get maybe more funding. That's my question. For uh, Stephen. Okay. This Stephen? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I work outside the realm of most funding issues other than trying to find my own to do research. Um, but I would say that for orbital debris, versus the threats from asteroids, we're looking at a size range that is completely different. So orbital debris, you have things like this pen that they can pick up on radar, uh, lots of them, and you're trying to collect that and somehow you know, remove that from low Earth orbit or, or moderate Earth orbit. Um, and then, so whatever mechanism you're gonna do is gonna be much bigger than the debris you're trying to remove. And then on the other extreme is you know, a threatening asteroid, maybe 30 meters in size if it's solid iron, 
and you have some kind of a technology you're going to try to deflect that with, which is on the small side. So you have different things, but you can imagine there might be, in terms of um, orbital rendezvous type uh, technologies uh, similar to that, uh, one would be hopefully in heliocentric orbit around the sun, other is in geocentric orbit around Earth, but some of those technologies might be similar to that. Um, maybe someone else has some... Yeah, I, I have one comment. And the technologies are not directly applicable, but... Uh, but the, the exact technologies you'd use for uh, asteroid capture or deflection are not really identical, but they're related. And if you look at the history of human interactions in space with uncontrolled bodies, as they call them, which is basically upper stages uh, spinning and uh, communication satellites that were meant to be captured, there are about six of these in the Soviet plus uh, uh, US history. And each one of them, the plan A failed. I think one of them succeeded, but plan A failed and plan B was sometimes planned uh, ahead of time, sometimes invented on the fly, and often that failed too, and you ended up with improvisation. So if we can't interact easily with a body where we know what it's made of, we know its density, we know its structure, and we know its spin rate and all that, even that is challenging, then I think we need some baby steps and maybe in that sense we can justify uh, orbital debris removal as a first step to also the techniques for uh, planetary defense. Next. Hi, I'm Alice Hoffman. I'm a project manager for design and construction, and I'd like to address uh, Mark's question on uh, risk management. Um, it's something that we do all the time in design and construction. One of the biggest ways we mitigate risk is by buying insurance. And what I'm wondering is, um, are there insurers who will take risk on subsurface issues in mining? Because in construction, that's one of the things we can't really get the insurers to do. And much less mining on Earth, is there anybody who's even thinking about doing um, risk mitigation through insurance uh, off-planet on asteroids? Well, I don't really know because we haven't tried. Um, there, are, there are aspects of the mining industry that, that, that can be covered by insurance, uh, breakdowns in, in uh, beneficiation plant and things like that. Uh, but the further you get into the, into the truly mining engineering side, the harder it is to find uh, easy insurance coverage. Um, one of our colleagues uh, in deep space industries, Kirby Eichen, and he's uh, of course the chairman of NSS as well, um, began his space career as a, as a space, as, a, as an insurance broker, working for a large Australian insurance company which was given the task of insuring uh, one of the earliest uh, or the first uh, Australian um, geostationary communication satellites and he turned that into a major market for his employers. Uh, so he's a space insurer. So I guess if anybody knows whether we can insure asteroid missions, it's going to be Kirby Eichen. He'll know where to go. Okay. Thanks, I'll talk to Mr Eichen. Okay, um, I don't see anyone else in line here, so I'll ask a couple of questions. Uh, and really, this is directed toward uh, Bong Wee, I think. The, uh, Mike. Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, this question is really directed toward uh, Bong Wee. Uh, it's pretty clear that we are looking seriously at uh, not only asteroid threat detection and also threat mitigation, but is that a role that should be applied just to our government or one government, or is it properly and should it be deferred to global global organizations? I think you, you, your comment very logical. And our planetary defense community has been looking at the legal issue, international legal issue, even uh, many other sociological issue. So, but we don't have any single organization, either international or domestic, which has been assigned to take care of such problem, but still it will take uh, many more years to find out what we can do internationally. But you made the right comment. 
that is a serious, serious issue we have to resolve as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thanks. I noticed there are a number of young people here today. There's a lot of young people in the audience that are potentially interested in being scientists themselves, potentially interested in their feet being the first ones that walk on an asteroid someday. So I'm curious to hear from anybody on the panel what your specific recommendations are to any of these kids who are, many of them are from foreign countries, of what you recommend for them to do in their education and after school that might help them to be a part of this uh, enterprise. Thank you. Go and study and get your degree in science or engineering. And keep interested in the literature, read widely. Read the, uh, read the technical journals, read things like uh, New Scientist, Scientific American, whatever you can get your hands on. Read uh, and, uh, and get yourself a degree in, in engineering or in science. And if it's science, I as a physicist would say, do physics. Physics is fun. Good question How's over that? here. Oh. Okay, well, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow uh, about a new field called applied astronomy. Astronomy used to be a practical field and uh, was supported by governments to do help with navigation. Uh, but I think uh, we've had a century when that hasn't been the case, but now uh, geologists are used to the idea that most of them work for mining companies or oil companies, and a few are academics, and uh, astronomers are going to come into the same regime, I think, where doing astronomy is a great way to make money, which is a stupid thing now, but uh, this could be something to cleverly position yourself for. Did you have questions? Oh yeah, I have some questions. I had a question for Mark. Uh, in, on Earth, your tailings, they stay put. Uh, in, in orbit, if you just let the tailings go, which are many times the mass of the material you want to bring home, uh, they're just going to spread out around the original orbit of the Neo, of the Near-Earth object, and uh, you may have an insurance risk there. Well, but what if you don't have any tailings? What if everything is useful? And I suspect that when we, not if, when, how's that? I suspect that when we start retrieving asteroid resources, we'll find use for everything that we collect. So there won't be no tailings, Martin. Silly me. <laughs> okay, uh, I have one last question for myself, since we're about time out. Uh, and it's really directed to the uh, three educators on the board. It's an education question. And that is, is there any real hope that we can educate the vast majority of the Earth's population um, that uh, asteroid exploitation, exploitation might be considered uh, valuable enough to be worth the risk for people who might view themselves as not having a chance of getting a reward? Well? Hey? Oh, yes. Mark. As an ex educator, I say yes. Um, the general populace isn't stupid if they're given information in a clear manner. A, a, a lot of uh, w w what passes as ignorance and what is ignorance uh, arises from media that doesn't present clear information, I think. And uh, I've been fascinated by the number of the colleagues of my daughters who are in the, their 20s and 30s who express great interest in the sort of stuff that we're doing and whether they're of a science uh, background or uh, uh, a non-science background or whether their education is at a high level or a low level, they, 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 they fairly readily and rapidly pick up the general story that people like us have to tell. So, yes, I think, I think education is possible. Of course I think education is possible. I spent seven years as an educator before I moved into the mining industry. And I think that there's, a, there's great potential for people to pick up the story and, and understand it and run with it. I have a comment on some of the question on the educational aspect. Until 2006, about what, six, seven years ago, I didn't know anything about planetary defense. 
I didn't know anything about the NEO. Still, I don't know the difference between asteroid and comet. <laughs> I cannot explain. It. But 2006, I attended a conference like this, and I was sitting over there. And this topic was so fascinating. During the last six years, I fully, I am concentrating on my professional career on this problem. So I strongly recommend whether you are in the high school or in the, you know, the, the young generations, you have a great future to apply your engineering and science educational background to this, not just asteroid deflection, plant defense, asteroid mining, and interplanetary mission design, or basically you're applying your calculus, a differential equation, all kinds of science. So I strongly recommend to be in this field. Thank you. you know, just, unfortunately, you know, we really don't have uh, any time for more questions. Um, we, one more, okay, one last comment. I like, to, I like to use the education part to turn it around, to use the space science to excite people about other aspects of education. You can use uh, meteorites to t teach children about densities. You can use them to teach them about chemistry. You can use astronomy to teach things about physics, um, engineering, things like that. So you can use this very exciting concept of space science to teach kids all sorts of different types of science and mathematics and chemistry and even biology nowadays with astrobiology going on. And so it, rather than try to teach them space science, use space science, which they always get wide-eyed about to teach them about everything else, because it's all interconnected. Um, thank you. Um, I, I applaud the comment the young man made about all the young people and students. Just two thoughts. Volunteer for as much as you can and look at, like, NSS local chapters or at universities or what have you, but you volunteer early in your life and you never know who you're going to meet or what, what opportunities will come your way. And along that same line, internships. There's a lot of internships with commercial companies, and it's a great way to get your foot in the door to start a career. Uh, thank you. We're, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for uh, attending the opening panel. Well, we, uh, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I'm Nikhil, I'm a high school student from New Jersey with this, um, the Space Settlement Competition. And I'm one of the students that the previous gentleman mentioned were interested in asteroid mining. Uh, last, last summer I did an internship at Columbia University on asteroid research, working, um, I'm, we're designing an experiment to see uh, how solar wind and cosmic ray impacts uh, affect the surface structure of these asteroids and uh, basically space weathering, how it's changed their reflective properties and how you can actually mistake asteroids but but for like what, what the composition is because the spectral signature could uh, make it look like it's a different type of asteroid. Um, I unfortunately missed the beginning of the talk, so I'm not sure if you addressed this, but um, have you thought about space weathering, the, the fact that uh, when, when you're looking at an asteroid, it might not be representative of the true interior, and uh, how do you plan to account for that? Uh, because I've read, a, I had to read dozens of papers on the subject myself, and th th there's no consensus. There's, there's time, time scale estimates from 10,000 to 25 billion years, which made no sense to me. But there, there's a lot of research that has to be done. How do you plan to account for that? Thank you. Look, um, question is, oh, you have it. I think it's a, it's a very valid point. I mean, we, we use, today we use meteorites. We have them in our hands to try to determine what the asteroids are made of, and it's, it's sometimes very difficult to link the meteorites with the spectra that we see of the asteroids, and many people think that's because of space weathering. And so we'd really like to have uh, an example where we've gone to an asteroid, landed on the surface, took a piece of it, brought it back, and say, oh, okay, so that's, that's what you know, we have going on here. We've only done that in one case. We've got 100 grains from the asteroid Itakawa. You know, and so we need more than that. We need a few grams from the next one, the OSIRIS-REx mission, and then potentially, you know, beyond that, uh, what, what you guys are talking about, the big resources. But that, that's a very important uh, distinction there. Oh, well, thank you. We really need to take a 10-minute break before we go on with the next asteroid uh, track session, which will be uh, uh, Dr. Elvis talking about uh, characterization of asteroids and what we can see. And uh, thank you, and all of these gentlemen will be giving additional talks, so if you want to learn more, uh, we'll have plenty of opportunities during the uh, asteroid track in the next few days. Uh, thank you. <laughs>